Joyce Appleby, what are you doing these days? What am I doing these days? I'm waiting for spring to arrive in Taos, New Mexico, so I can start gardening. Are I, you still writing? Are you still teaching? No, I'm not writing and I'm not teaching. I decided, you know, after nine books, maybe I should start reading other people's books. And that's what I've been doing with great pleasure, great pleasure. Do you miss being here at UCLA? Oh, I miss people from UCLA, but no, no. Uh, retirement is wonderful. It's just wonderful. You get to do what you want to do. You have time to read the newspaper for two hours if you want in the morning. No. The only downside of retirement is that it coincides with old age. <laughs> what book are you best known for, do you think? Hmm, I don't know. I don't know. Possibly Inheriting the Revolution, which was a social history of the first generation of Americans, that is to say those who were born after 1776 and therefore didn't have any colonial background, uh, but inherited the revolution, inherited this tradition. They heard about it from their fathers and grandfathers. And I think that, if not that, perhaps the Relentless Revolution, which was a history of capitalism. I really don't know. I think that's, you'd have to ask somebody else that question. Are you still active with the American Historical Association? No. No. I get the journal. I read the journal. No, you know, I moved to Taos uh, almost two years ago. So I left the big city life and I sort of left professional life because I was no longer, I used to live across the street from UCLA, so I felt very much a part of the campus. But I love it. It's a, I, I live in a, basically a rural area. It's right in the southern Rockies, so it's very high. It's about 7,000 feet and very dry. It's, it, it's a totally different environment. But Taos is, is also a cultural center. Um, a lot of art, a lot of intellectual life, a lot of music. How many years did you teach here at UCLA and what did you teach? I taught 20 years at UCLA. And then I lived here for another, let's see, I don't know, seven or eight years after I retired. And what courses did you teach? I taught the, well, the introductory course that we all taught but uh, the 17th and 18th century American history courses. When did you get interested as a person in the 17th and 18th centuries? I suppose when I went to graduate school, um, I had a marvelous mentor named Douglas Adair, and he could make anything seem charming, and he, he loved to have his graduate students do the age of Jefferson, uh, which is from Jefferson's birth to his death in 26, so 43 to 26. But being an historian, I moved backwards, and I, and I went back to the beginning of the 17th century. And I also studied English history, and indeed I wrote a book on English history. Joyce Appleby, we've invited you to be on Book TV here at UCLA uh, for your most recent book, Shores of Knowledge, New World Discoveries, and the Scientific Imagination. What are you attempting to do with this book? Well, in writing the book, I love that cover. I didn't design it, so I can just say I well, love it. Well, what's on the cover? Well, there's just Columbus and then all the things that Columbus, he's presenting these things to Ferdinand and Isabella and Native Americans that he's brought back and parrots uh, and pineapples, which is really an anachronism because the oh, Europeans fell in love with pineapple, but pineapple could not survive the trip, so it only came back as dried pineapple. And they have great, you know, you know, uh, trays full of pineapples. And pineapple very quickly became a symbol both of hospitality and luxury. One of the interesting, that along with the eagle uh, became the symbols for the United States, for the, excuse me, for the, the Americas. Anyway, what I, what I was trying to do for my own satisfaction was to answer a question. It's a fascinating question. How is it that the West which is known for its investigative spirit, which is in which its scientific inquisitiveness is really kind of the essence of Western culture. How did they ever release curiosity from the prohibitions that the church had maintained on it? From Augustine through the 16th century, the Catholics and later Protestants preached that you are not to be curious about God's creation. It was an adultery of the soul to ask about comets or tides or shapes of the earth. 
And so this was a question to me, what, how do they break through this? And my hunch was that it was Columbus. Not just his discoveries, but what he brought back. All of these flamboyant uh, birds and, you know, weird animals, stories of exotic people. Of course, he brought some back. And the stunning topography of the Americas. And that this was so fascinating, it just, people had to break through the prohibition against curiosity. And they did. From that time on, they become curious about the natural world. And then they're very curious about what's the relation of these weird new things to the old things. So they had never really looked at the natural objects around them before, but now that they had this question of comparison, they begin to. So that was my question, was how did curiosity free itself from the strictures of the church? But when I finished the story, I really had done what the subtitle said. I'd really shown how the New World discoveries had led to this scientific imagination, which changed European society from its isolated, very rigid cultural system to this one that we know is expansive, aggressive even, and curious. And, and uh, so I, it was really a history of the origins of the natural sciences. Well, I want to start with the, the conclusion. The okay. last sentence in your book, retrospectively, the most significant consequence of the age of discovery is the awakening of Europeans' curiosity about the world in which they lived. And you attribute that to Christopher Columbus. I attribute that to the things he brought back. Because he was, he was, a, uh, he was a, an, a Johnny Appleseed before the Johnny Appleseed. He brought things back, everything that was roused his curiosity, he brought back to Europe, then he took to Europe everything that he hadn't seen in uh, the New World that Europeans grew and had, and animals as well, as, as well as rats on the ships, which really f flourished in the New World. Uh, so it's that, what some has called the Columbian Exchange, that I see as laying the basis for um, the study of botany, the study of zoology, uh, you know, sort of ornithology and you know, all these things, but they but they started with amateurs, and and I end with the greatest amateur of all, Charles Darwin. He was an amateur. He was he never used the word scientist. He called referred to other inquirers as naturalists, and it's sort of fascinating to see. At first, uh, they bring back these curiosities, as they call them, and the wealthy noblemen, rich merchants, had cabinets of curiosities. You know, they loved to have a toucan beak and a, a feather from a bird and seed pods. And, and they had menageries. Soon they got animals. They, they had a park that could keep all these interesting animals. So it started out with this sort of <laughs> vulgar display, you might say. But then people saw, oh, this is very interesting. This is a, this puma. It's not really a lion, is it? No. And the yama, a camel? Well, it doesn't really look like a camel. And this comparison began to lead to some collecting of data about these animals and these uh, plants, and not to mention the people. And of course, the other thing, it was rather undermining of two traditions in Europe. It was undermining of the Greek tradition because there was no Aristotle said there was no life at the equator. That was one of the things he said. And it was undermining of the biblical tradition because these animals were not on Noah's Ark. They were, you know, these, this new world was not in the Bible. So this, I think, enhanced curiosity. Became more free, more speculative, and perhaps more necessary to have explanations. To go to the start of your book, you said that the Catholic Church waged a campaign against curiosity. Right. What was, what was the goal, or what was the reason for that? I think it was probably its otherworldliness. It certainly started with St. Augustine at the time that the Roman Empire was collapsing, and the Church was seen as the one safe place. Uh, and I think, I think there was a sense that job of the, of the human being was to understand what God wanted of them and not to be invested in the world around them. 
and there was also the sense 